So hello everyone, my name is Darla Saunders and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation and the Canadian Rivers Institute, I would like to officially welcome you to the first webinar in the third year of the series. The series is made possible in part thanks to the contributions of the Government of Canada. So to kick off this season's webinar series, we're extremely lucky to be hosting Yolanda Wiersma. She is an associate professor in the Department of Biology at Memorial University St. John campus, where she has been since 2006. Her research interests are quite interdisciplinary and cover landscape conservation and resource management questions in the boreal region. She has collaborated with marine biologists, aquatic ecologists, geographers, historians, and information system scientists and authored and co-authored over 30 papers related to wildlife, forest, and landscape ecology. And we're absolutely delighted to have her here today. So after the presentation, we'll open the floor for a question and answer session. You'll have the option of asking questions directly using your microphone, or you can type them in and I will read them aloud. So I'm now going to turn the webinar over to Yolanda. All right. Thank you very much, Darla. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, I, I'm speaking here, uh, as Darla said, um, but I'm really representing a, a large group of people whose names are all there on, on the first slide. And what I'd like to do in the next um, while is give you an overview of some of the research that this group of us has been doing on measuring uh, aquatic connectivity. So like I said, it's been a, a big team uh, of researchers from a variety of, of agencies, as you can see. And also, before I jump in, we've also been funded from a, a number of uh, sources. And I also need to put a shout out to the many staff on the ground, both at Parks Canada and DFO, and some of my own students in my lab who have helped out with uh, some of the field work that made some of this research possible. So let's begin with, well, why should we measure riverscape connectivity? Because that's really what this work over the past few years has been about. Well, as we all know, uh, human developments uh, on aquatic systems, whether those are large-scale dams, smaller uh, low-head dams, or whether they're culverts, can impact the connectivity of a stream or a river system. And these barriers, these human developments or uh, human structures can have all kinds of effects. They can affect the productivity of the aquatic ecosystem, they can affect the species composition both upstream and downstream of the barrier, they can affect dispersal, which in turn can affect population sizes, potentially contributing to extinction risk, there might be changes in genetics, and on and on and on. Cumulatively, all these things might affect the ecological integrity of a watershed in its entirety. And ecological integrity is something that Parks Canada has been concerned about, and that's really where this research kind of has its origin. This, starts, this work started with some early beginnings, and Dave likes to point out some mistakes in Terra Nova National Park, which, um, as you probably know, is the easternmost park in, in Canada. And essentially, Dave Cote was hired there as a, as a park ecologist, and he was still pretty new in the job, and his uh, superintendent came to him and said, we have some funds to restore some culverts along the trans Canada Highway, which runs through the park. And from an ecological perspective, which ones do you think are the best ones uh, to, to prioritize, to restore and uh, improve them so that fish have an easier time getting uh, across them? So there was this, this need immediately to identify uh, which water systems were the most uh, important and which uh, culverts were maybe the most, uh, most uh, challenging for fish to go through. Well, Dave was new in the job. He hadn't really had a lot of time to get to know the park, to get to know the watershed system, so he did a quick survey of the culverts, prioritized them basically based on the severity of the barrier in terms of, you know, if it was a real bad perch culvert or a really steep culvert. Um, also, what species were known to be in the river based on some really quick surveys and as well as um, talking uh, to locals about what they suspected were potentially good rivers or what they remembered had been good rivers for some of the target species. So it was very much a very rapid assessment, uh, a little bit, Dave likes to say, flying by the seat of their pants, to determine which culverts uh, would be the ones to um, prioritize. What they focused on in their restoration activities was reducing outlet drops and reducing velocity. They increased structural complexity within the culverts by introducing baffles and cobbles and that sort of thing. They did some monitoring after the restoration activities and it indicated that fish were able to pass all of the restored culverts. So that was sort of a check uh, that at the local scale they had been successful. But they realized in hindsight, and this is where the sort of early mistakes come in, was that the site selection was not necessarily great. In one system, they realized after the fact that while the fish could get through the culvert, 
um, only a few hundred meters upstream was a very large waterfall which functioned as a natural barrier. And so at a landscape scale, um, that might not have been uh, an optimal place to put dollars into restoring a barrier. And so the success at that scale was mixed. But it was um, a worthwhile process in that some valuable lessons were learned. Uh, restoration when you're talking about looking at aquatic uh, connectivity and looking at watershed scale uh, issues, you have to consider multiple spatial scales. Making mistakes can be costly because implementing this kind of restoration is a fairly huge engineering task, and so you want to make sure you're doing it right. But at the same time, sometimes these opportunities come up rather quickly, as in this case there was some money from transportation to improve the highway that had some ecological benefits. So this is where Dave realized that what was really necessary was a metric for measuring aquatic connectivity so that those numbers could be at one's fingertips or easily calculated when such opportunities came up. And that's where I came into uh, the research picture with, with this group. I'd just been hired at Memorial University. I'm a landscape ecologist, and I'd only been here a few months when I got a call from Dave that said, you know, hi, I'm Dave Cote, I'm the Parks Canada Ecologist, and I hear you're a landscape ecologist. And I said, yes. And he said, well, I'm an aquatic biologist, and uh, I hear you know how to measure connectivity and fragmentation. And I said, well, yeah, landscape ecologists are pretty good at that. And he said, well, do you know how to do it in a, in a watershed, in a, river, in a riverscape setting? And I had to give it some thought. So in terrestrial landscape ecology, we think about fragmentation or the converse connectivity quite a lot, and it's different, as I began to think about it, from a riverscape. So um, in a landscape, in a terrestrial landscape, we have patches of habitat, and those may become fragmented if we imagine these green blobs here as forests, and maybe there's little patches of corridors of hedgerows or little uh, uh, green spaces that connect them um, to keep that landscape connected such that an animal could move from one green blob to the other. In a, in a riverscape, we, have, we might have suitable habitat for a particular species on one tributary and another tributary, and the fish can move downstream and then back upstream between the two patches. Now, if we introduce a barrier, the story is quite different in a terrestrial system versus an aquatic system. In a terrestrial system, a single barrier usually doesn't have a very dramatic impact on fragmentation because there are alternate routes an animal can take. Whereas in an aquatic system, a barrier can be... Um, a, a, can, can create complete fragmentation. So we have lots of ways of quantifying these patterns of connectivity and fragmentation in the terrestrial sense. But as I dug further, I realized that none of them were really applicable in the aquatic sense, and there were no indices or metrics to measure them in the aquatic sense. So Dave, uh, along with Dan Keeler and I, we invented one, which is we call the Dendritic Connectivity Index, or the DCI for short. So the DCI is quite simple. Um, it basically measures the probability that an ind individual fish can move freely between two points in the river network. It's scale independent, and it's quite a, a relatively simple formula. It really has only two parameters. One is this, this um, parameter C, which is the passability of an individual culvert, and you quantify that across all culverts in your in your watershed. And then the lengths of the segments between potential barriers um, divided by the total length of the watershed. And, and that's essentially the only two elements you need is segment length and passability, which um, I'll go into detail a little bit about how we uh, measure those. But essentially, you can put those into the formula, crunch the numbers, and come up with an index for passability, or a, an index for connectivity. Excuse me. So we came up with two sort of flavors of the DCI, one for pentadromous cases and one for diadromous cases. And we simulated in a, a sort of model uh, watershed how the DCI behaved when we changed different things within the watershed. So we changed the severity of the barriers. So we defined barrier passability as zero as a completely impassable barrier that no fish ever get over, and one being a completely passable barrier. So it's a scale of zero to one. We um, modeled how the DCI changed when we changed that. We modeled how it changed when we changed the location of barriers, the cumulative effects when we add additional barriers to a system, and also the fish life history. So you can see some of that here in this figure, which is from our, our very first paper from 2009. So on the left here, we have a pentagonist case. And you can see here that the DCI is the lowest when the barrier is near the middle of the watershed versus when it's near the mouth of the, the uh, watershed. 
The opposite is, is true in the diatomous case, and this makes uh, intuitive sense when you think about the fish life history. They have to migrate from the ocean up uh, some distance into the system. Oops. Sorry. Um, and the DCI is lowest when the barrier is closest to the mouth of the, the system versus when it's up uh, midway through the system. So the DCI kind of behaved intuitively as we, we expected. Um, published the paper and it got a little bit uh, of attention, but we realized there was, there was still quite a lot of work to do. And a key issue is this issue of passability. Because passability is one of the components in the equation for calculating the DCI, the DCI really depends on how do you define uh, when a barrier is passable or how do you quantify that passability. So there's a huge literature on passability across individual barriers and there are many different methods for defining passability. These can be based on population structure, they can be directly observed by whether fish move across a barrier or not. Some people use genetics as a proxy, some people model it, uh, other people use uh, rule-based methods, and some people draw on expert opinion. Uh, we chose to use fish crossing, which is a freeware that's available that basically takes information about the fish, their length, their swim speed, their species, uh, the information about the culvert, its shape, its diameter, um, its length, its slope, etc. And it comes up with a range of possible flows, which then you can compare to the, to the flow regime in your system to decide either um, what's the probability that a fish can cross that particular culvert or what's the proportion of time of year where the flow rates are amenable for the fish to get through that culvert. So the first master's student that worked with us, Christina Bourne, one of her uh, chapters was looking at, well, how sensitive is the DCI to these different ways of measuring, conic or measuring passability? So she played with different uh, variations of fish length, fish swim speed, stream flow, and also length of season of the migration, and used those to calculate passability for real culverts in Terranova National Park, and then used those in turn to calculate the DCI. So what you can see here is um, her number of catchments um, with different values of DCI. So the, the dark is the, the most connected watershed. So most of the watershed, nine of the, the watersheds in Terranova um, have a connectivity uh, index of between 76 and 100. When we just consider passability from the perspective of measuring it during the time of year that salmon are migrating. And it has a very similar pattern when we look at trout migration period uh, changes a little bit when we look at, at the sort of parameters for fish crossing for trout across an entire year versus just when they might be moving. But really the take home message of this figure here is that the actual values of the DCI change a little bit, but basically the relative rankings, the relative positions don't change too much. On an individual barrier perspective, we saw all kinds of odd things going on. These are individual culverts on the x-axis here and the figure on the right, and this is the passability estimates. And the black, little black rectangles are the mean with all these different uh, variations that we threw into fish crossing, and the hollow rectangles are the variation. So some of our culverts didn't vary at all. They were always impassable no matter what we threw at them, no matter what we threw into fish crossing, they never were going to be uh, a thing a barrier that a fish would get across. And some of them, depending on what combination of, of uh, parameters we threw into fish crossing, could be defined as, as passable all the time or impassable all the time. So there was a lot, a fair bit of uncertainty in the passability estimates of the individual culverts, but we still found that the ranking of the culverts across the park in terms of which ones had the most impacts on connectivity didn't really change. So in a relative sense, the DCI still worked consistently, but was obviously the number, the value, the absolute uh, sense was sensitive to measurements of passability. So we wanted to do a little bit more work on passability, in particular try to validate some of our estimates of passability. So Shad Malam, who was the second student on the project, he worked on uh, some data from some experimental, some in-situ in experimental work that had been set up in the park whereby we had um, these antenna arrays located in the stream system across culverts and across control streams. So we had four of these um, and we pit tagged fish um, so that when they passed through the culvert, if they were detected upstream and downstream in the antenna array, that would be deemed to be a pass event. 
Whereas if they were only detected downstream but not upstream, it meant the fish tried to get up, upstream in the culvert but failed to do so. And then we had a similar uh, array set up uh, in control sections. So we could compare how fish moved through a culvert versus how they moved in a, in a natural section of the stream. We estimated how passable that culvert should be or how, how passable we thought it was based on fish crossing and we compared it to the data from the, real, from the pit tagged fish. And this is what Shad found is that, so here we have on, the, on this figure, this is from uh, Shad's paper in uh, Transactions of the American Fisheries Society, we have the discharge rate on the x-axis and we have the cumulative frequency of pass events. On the y-axis, the bottom cluster of points is uh, in the culvert and the top cluster is in the reference, so the control area of the stream. So what you can see is that the range of passable flows is more restricted in the culverts. The fish doesn't get through the culvert when the, when the discharge rate uh, gets higher. Um, but it didn't necessarily fit the predictions very well, as we'll see on the next slide. So it, it behaved, the fish behave as we expected. They don't pass through culvert as easily as they pass through a reference stream. And so at a qualitative le level, defining pass, uh, culverts as having lower passability works. But fish crossing itself as a predictor of, of passability was much, much too conservative. So here on this figure, you've got uh, now discharge rate on the y-axis. The gray little wedge at the bottom is the range of lengths of fish comparable to discharge rates at which we predict the fish to actually get through that uh, particular culvert. So this is data from a single culvert. The green squares are successful pass events, and the red triangles are unsuccessful pass attempts. And so you can see there's a lot of green squares outside of that little gray wedge, it means a lot of times a fish is able to pass when fish crossing says it shouldn't. So while we qualitatively know that culverts and pea passability, when we quantify it, we have very imperfect understanding. But as we knew from Christina's work, those effects may not generally or may not greatly have an effect on how we prioritize barriers for restoration or on the overall effect of how we measure the overall connectivity. But they're still important. They're still certainly important in terms of um, how much we need to worry about an individual culvert in terms of trying to restore it because if we base it just on um, a particular metric like from fish crossing, we may be acting much too conservatively. So the next thing we wanted to do was then validate um, the DCI at a broader scale and also in a different system than the one it was designed for. So the DCI, we sort of did the preliminary testing Terra Nova, which is fairly impoverished in terms of uh, its fish community compared to many other systems. And, and, we, and the watersheds there are fairly small. So we were lucky that uh, we had Les Stanfield from the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources get involved and had a, uh, quite a large data set from five watersheds just east of Toronto. And what um, these have a much uh, more diverse fish community, um, but are also much more impacted than in Terra Nova, where really most of the culverts are along the Trans Canada um, near the mouth of the system. Here we have watersheds, if you're at all familiar with this area, we ha um, along the shore of uh, the lake, it's highly urbanized, and then it transitions into sort of a semi-urban uh, agricultural matrix, and the headwaters of all of these watersheds are on the Oak Ridges Moraine, which is now part of the Toronto Green Belt, so it's sort of semi-natural. Semi so there's a gradient of uh, habitat and human impact and density of barriers um, as you go from upstream to downstream in these five watersheds. And there's a really different fish community than what we had in Terra Nova. So we wanted to use the system from Ontario to test uh, some hypotheses about connectivity and its impact on fish communities. So we hypothesized that across these five watersheds, those that had higher overall connectivity, as measured with the DCI, would have higher overall fish richness. They'd be more connected, they'd be less fragmented, so there would be more available habitat for fish to access if they were migrating up from the lake or if they were staying within the watershed to move around the watershed. And so, as well, we predicted there would be higher uh, biomass. 
However, uh, we realized there were probably some confounding effects uh, of the stream habitat itself. The habitats of the streams are very different from the headwaters as you get down to the lake, and as well the surrounding land use. As I already said, the, the downstream areas are highly urbanized and the upstream are more sort of semi-natural forests with some agricultural land um, around the mid areas. And those might have an effect as well on fish richness and fish biomass. So we had electrofishing data sets. So we, we had um, 273 data points um, across these five watersheds of, of fish data. We had GIS layers for the dams. We had some culvert surveys. We didn't know for certain the possibility of uh, those culverts, but we did know which ones were perched culverts and thus likely to be highly impassable. And we had estimates for the passability uh, of all the others. So what Shad did in his master's work was to um, calculate the DCI across each of these five watersheds. When we initially developed the DCI, we, we used um, code in, in R, which is a statistical software package. But since then, there's been a GIS extension built called FIPEX. It was funded um, jointly by Parks Canada and DFO, and it's a free extension to ArcGIS. So any ArcGIS users out there who want to calculate the DCI, you just have to look up FIPEX and you can download it and, and run it right off your GIS software and all you need then is the streams layer and a, a, line, a polyline layer for your streams and a points layer for your barriers and uh, you can calculate the DCI quite quickly and easily. So uh, Shad was sort of one of the beta testers of FIPEX um, which was great to have and then he analyzed how the DCI across those five watersheds, as well as the habitats and the species richness, species abundance, and species biomass might be related. And what he found was that the DCI is, was a significant predictor of abundance and biomass, as well as species richness. So what he found was that when looking across these five watersheds, the um, more connected ones did have higher abundance in biomass and species richness, but it wasn't um, a hugely significant relationship. It turned out that the other factors like the stream size, the elevation, the surrounding habitat also had a lot of um, explanatory power for the fish community patterns. It differed by species as well, so these, the across species the DCI did contribute to explaining the community patterns, but it didn't contribute a huge amount. But for individual species, for some species, it did contribute a, a little bit more. So one example was the rainbow trout, where there was a fairly um, significant relationship between DCI and rainbow trout abundance. But as you can see from this figure, there's still um, a, a lot of noise and a lot of unexplained variation in the data. Other people have applied the DCI. DCI um, in other systems across North America. This bottom figure here is from a paper uh, by Perkin and Guido in the United States, and they found a much tighter relationship between the DCI and fish community patterns, but they only looked at second and third order streams, so they didn't look at an entire watershed scale. So our, our sense at this point is that there is a scale effect going on, and then at certain broad scales, other landscape factors like habitat around the stream or um, stream uh, parameters like elevation or stream order may explain more in the species composition than things like the, deep, the, the connectivity as measured with the DCI. But we need to do more work before we can totally um, be confident in that uh, hypothesis. So really uh, the take home message of, of the work we've done to date is that we've realized that aquatic connectivity is definitely important to fish community structure. There's, there's no doubt that uh, barriers and, and such as culverts and dams have an impact on fish community and that it, when you consider these at a watershed scale, when you consider connectivity across a watershed, it certainly has an important influence on fish community structure. We still need to do a lot more research to, to more fully understand this. As I've already uh, illustrated, we've started some research on trying to better understand passability, but more work needs to be done on that. And at the watershed scale, we need to do more to integrate um, understanding of habitat, both the surrounding habitat in the watershed and the habitat of the stream itself. Because right now in the DCI, the only parameter of the stream is the length of the segments, and we're not treating, we're treating all segments 
equally in terms of uh, what they are. We're not trying to differentiate between streams that might have a certain uh, substrate type that's more suitable for a species than stream segments that might have a less suitable substrate. We're not integrating things like uh, temperature or depth or uh, flow rate or any of those other things that are certainly important for fish when they're selecting habitat. And so there's definitely ways we could um, add uh, information and complexity to the DCI to improve our understanding. Um, but like I said, that's down the road. Uh, we certainly realize that the level of influence of connectivity on fish communities is scale dependent. Um, as we saw in Ontario, the connectivity is currently secondary to other habitat attributes, but as we've seen in some papers that have come out from other researchers, um, at smaller spatial extents, connectivity seems to be more important in explaining fish pattern. But that also may be due to the which fish species are present, um, as well as to the sort of history of the system and the degree to which the system may or may not be uh, impacted. So some research we'd like to do in the future is to improve our understanding between connectivity and fish-related processes. Uh, we still need to do a lot more validation and investigation, both of the DCI as a whole, but also just the possibility of, of barriers. And so um, that requires large data sets. Um, watersheds are big, and so you need uh, data from across the watershed, upstream and downstream of barriers, headwaters, uh, amounts of, of watersheds, and those kind of data can be difficult to access. Ideally, it would be great to get some data from um, a watershed before it's impacted and after it has some impacted for a comparative approach, um, but that that um, I'm not sure if those those data are out there. But if they they are and anybody knows about it, I'd love to hear about it. Um, and as I already mentioned, defining possibility still remains um, to be quite a challenge. And really, I think the only way to resolve it is is probably from a management perspective to take a species specific approach and say, okay, for this watershed, we're really worried about uh, you know, making the entire watershed accessible for this particular species, and so we're going to define passability within the watershed on that fish's um, swimming abilities and its migratory period, et cetera, et cetera. Communicating this is also really important, and because this initially started as a project with Parks Canada, um, they focused a, a fair bit on outreach. And um, given the audience I'm speaking to today, I think there's probably also an interest in, in communicating this to the public because rivers are um, not something people always think about um, the intricacies of. I know the people listening do, but the general public maybe does not. And we drive over roads um, that have culverts crossing streams all the time without even giving them a second thought. So raising public awareness about um, how built features like culverts and roads can have an impact on streams is important. And in the early days of this work, Parks Canada um, did invest quite a bit of uh, its personnel and its educational resources into this. And I, I think they did, it, did some excellent um, outreach and education at Terranova. They had, um, in the early years of this project, there was a really talented staff of, of young uh, summer interpreters who, who did some really excellent projects. If after this talk, if uh, you don't want to get right back to your desk and you want to uh, grab a coffee and, and do something uh, entertaining for, for five minutes, I encourage you to just go to YouTube and Google Brooks on Brooks, which is a short video that um, the park produced to raise uh, public awareness about the effect of culverts on stream connectivity. Um, in the summer of, I think it was 2011, 2010 or 2011, they did an outdoor theater program um, at the park once a week uh, for the campers in the park about our research. And I had the good fortune of camping in the park at the time and getting to sit in the audience. And um, it's quite something to, to watch some really talented performers who can act and who can sing and who can make creative costumes turn what's kind of a dry research paper into basically a piece of musical theater, which is what they did. And um, it was really entertaining. My kids loved it. You know, the audience liked it, and it got the message across in a much more effective way than uh, if I could, stand, you know, if I had to stand up in front of people and, and give a, a research talk. They also built a little uh, remote control fish, and had a little mini culvert that they took to trade shows, that they took to school groups and stuff to sort of get across the message that you know these barriers can be difficult for fish. Uh, to get across. And so there's all kinds of bigger and little ways that um, getting the message across through to the general public is uh, can be done. And I think this project had that. I wasn't involved in any of this, but 
I saw a lot of it and was really impressed by it. So I, I want to just sort of acknowledge uh, the work that some of those uh, education and outreach folks did related to this project. And that's um, really just a real quick overview of the research we've done. So um, Dave's email is there, my email is there. We, the two of us have kind of been the lead on all of this work, but um, two master's students and uh, a few other agency uh, scientists have been really involved as well. So uh, I hope that gives you a sense of what we've been up to and 